good to see a good number gathered in already. We'll have a wee bit of community singing, again some very well-known hymns, just while everyone's gathering in. Hymn number 439, if you're using the hymn book, I have a shepherd, one I love so well, how he has blessed me, tongue can never tell. I'm going to sing the first three verses of this hymn, please. singing just over the page hymn number 434 he leadeth me O blessed thought O words with heavenly comfort fraught whate'er I do where'er I be still tis God's hand that leadeth me and again we'll sing the first three verses of this hymn is it 224 okay I don't even know what I'm singing <laughs> 224 Matthew did tell me that last night of course but I've forgotten
next hymn, I believe, yes, is hymn number 324. I once was a stranger to grace and to God. I knew not my danger and felt not my load. Though friends spoke in rapture of Christ on the three, Jehovah Sikenu was nothing to me. And maybe you're here tonight and you're a stranger to grace and to God. You don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior. Our prayer is tonight, as you listen to the gospel message proclaimed, that this will be the night whenever you will come in faith to Jesus Christ, realizing that you're a sinner, realizing that you have a soul to be saved, and knowing indeed that Christ alone is your only hope for salvation. So we'll sing verses 1, 3, and 4 of this beautiful gospel hymn. I once was a stranger to grace and to God. singing. Thank you, Andrew. We're going to worship God tonight, and we're using the words of hymn number 304 on the hymn book. We are never, never weary of the grand old song, Glory to God, Hallelujah. We can sing it loud as ever with our faith more strong, Glory to God, Hallelujah. When you come to that word hallelujah, don't be afraid of it. Let it go as we stand to sing this hymn 304. For those who follow the screen, just look up. It's a good idea to keep looking up, you know. So look up and join in as we worship God, please.
Let's be still for a little time. We're going to prayer. And then after we pray, we'll ask our sister Natasha to come then. I'll give her a chance to get a wee drop of water there. We'll pray and then we'll ask our sister to come to sing. Let's all pray. Father, we're thankful again tonight for the privilege of being found in the presence of God. And that's a great honor conferred upon us to have this privilege of appearing before Almighty God. And loving Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the access that we have to thy throne of grace tonight. It's through the person and work of thy Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't need ritual, we don't need crosses or images, anything of that nature. We can approach freely unto the God of heaven through the only mediator there is between God and man, the Lord Jesus Christ, the priest with wounded hands and a wounded side and a nail-scarred brow. We're thankful for the one who died an atoning death on Calvary's cross. They took him down from the cross. They buried him in Joseph's tomb. We're thankful that he lay there for a short period of time and then the moment came when he arose from the dead. He triumphed over the devil, over Satan and sin and death itself, and he lives forever in the power of an endless life. And according to the teaching of the Holy Scriptures, he's coming again. It's not a fable. It's not something a man has thought up. It is revealed in the Holy Scriptures that Jesus Christ is coming. This time he's not coming to die for sinners, he's coming to judge sinners. He's coming to take vengeance upon the ungodly and sinners who have rebelled against God and rebelled against the many invitations given in the gospel, pardon their hearts. They don't believe in God, they don't believe in eternity and a place of separation from God. Oh, Heavenly Father, that's a great day for the saints of God but a very tragic time for all those out of Christ. Coming of the Lord draweth nigh. And in the light of that, in the light of what we have heard over these past nights in the gospel, we pray that we will prepare to meet God. If there is a man or woman gathered tonight in this house, and they've never bowed the knee at the cross, even tonight, remove hardness, remove anything that would be of a, a Lord, a, a, a contrary spirit to the spirit of God, And we pray that that will give humility of heart and exercising faith in Jesus Christ and turning to embrace him freely offered in the gospel. To this end, bless thy servant as he preaches the word tonight. We thank thee for his faithfulness. Thank thee for the simple message, the clear message, the powerful message. And once again, as he declares this old gospel message that we love and cherish, that God will bless him and that it may be the means of seeing souls saved for the glory of God. So that men can, women can, men and women can return to their homes tonight and place their head upon the pillow and, and go to bed content. Just in case they never see another day, it will be absent from the body and present with the Lord. Bless our sister. She comes to minister to us and every aspect of the meeting tonight. Bless in every way. And at the end of the service, even before the meeting closes, May some man or some woman, young person, have closed with Christ and sought him for salvation. Abide with us now and do us good. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Now we have a young uh, woman with us tonight. She was a member of my congregation in Ballygowan. She was only about eight or nine when I left to go to America. She sang for the first time in the pulpit. She was very small, height of two daisies, as the saying is. She came up to the pulpit, nobody could see her behind the pulpit, so I had a little basket, or a little bucket, a bucket, as we say, a little box or a step. So I had to lift her up onto the step for the people to see her, and I'm glad I don't have to lift her tonight. And uh, she's got a stronger voice now than she had then, but we're delighted to have her, and I want to ask Natasha to come to bring to us her two messages. So thank you.
certainly no trouble hearing her tonight uh, did tremendously well thank you very much for coming we really did enjoy your ministry may the lord bless you tonight we're going to have the announcements now i want to ask your brother mr mclean to come and make those announcements for us please Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome along to our gospel service tonight, and indeed the final night of our gospel mission here in Coleraine Free Presbyterian Church. You're very welcome, and it's good to see you here. And for those visiting with us, we give to you a special word of welcome. And can I also again thank our sister Natasha for singing to us tonight, and we certainly appreciated and enjoyed her ministry and song. I want to welcome, of course, again, uh, our evangelist, Dr. William McRae, and uh, we do thank him for ministering to us, uh, both in song and in word, uh, over the course of the mission, and we thank him uh, for his work and labours in the gospel. Just after the meeting tonight, there's supper provided for everyone, and that will be in the church hall, so if you're not familiar with our church, just go out through the doors there and turn left, and just go down to the church hall, and you're invited to stay and remain with us, enjoy a time of fellowship and some food and refreshments together this evening. The announcements then for the incoming week in the will of God as follows. Monday at 7, the children's meeting, the kids' Bible club, takes place in the church hall. And then Tuesday night at 8, we have our prayer meeting and Bible study. Our inter-moderator, the Reverend Irwin, will be along to bring the word on Tuesday night. And then Friday night for our young people, please note uh, they'll be traveling to the Easter Convention in the Martyrs Church in Belfast. The bus will be leaving the church car park at 6.30 p.m. So please uh, assemble just a little before that to make your way down to Belfast. Then next Lord's Day, Sunday the 31st of March, please note there's no Sunday school or Bible class due to the Easter break. The service is at half past 11 and half past 6 when the preacher is Mr. Jonathan Eccles, a student in the Whitfield College of the Bible and those meetings preceded by half an hour of prayer. And then just to mention again the Easter Convention as I said that will be held in the Martyrs Memorial Church of course it's a highlight of the, the calendar for our church and the first meeting is on Friday the 29th of March at 8pm 
uh, the youth rally. The Reverend Timothy Nelson from Tyndale Free Presbyterian Church will be the preacher. And then on Saturday, the 30th of March at half past seven, it is the missionary rally, various missionaries taking part. And the Reverend, or sorry, Dr. John McKnight from the USA will be the preacher. And then the final meeting on Monday, the 1st of April at 7 p.m., the final convention rally. And again, Dr. McKnight will be the speaker. There will be supper provided after each of those meetings and everyone is welcome to attend. So I think those are all the announcements at this stage made subject to the will of God. So I'll hand back now to the Reverend Irwin. Thank you. Thank you, brother, for making the announcements. I'd just like to thank you one and all for your faithfulness over these past two weeks and your attendance, for being here in person and for bringing others along. We are indebted to you. We've enjoyed the help and the blessing of God each night. One of the features of the mission has been the stillness, the quietness uh, that the Lord sent each night when the gospel was being preached. So we're thankful to all who've helped in any way, especially to Dr. McCray. We've enjoyed his singing and the sermons we, each night. We've been challenged and blessed through his work and in the pulpit here. And we're thankful to God for him taking the time to come to join with us each night and to preach to us. May the Lord bless you, brothers, you've done this unto the Savior. Also, a word of thanks to Mrs. McCray. She was here most nights. I think she missed one night, but she had a good reason for that. And our friends also there who have come across for the mission from England, we're glad that you've been with us faithfully. We appreciate your thoughtfulness and your support. May God bless you as no doubt you return soon to your home. It's good to have had fellowship with you. We're going to sing another hymn, and the offering will be received now at this stage. It's the hymn number 234. Now let me just say, uh, just by way of warning, uh, when Mr. McCray does finish his part, uh, then we will sing a closing hymn. And we're going to sing a closing hymn simply to allow the workers here to go to the uh, hall and to get everything ready for us so that everything will be in place when the meeting is dismissed and you can go there. So that's a little bit changed. Once, or, once Mr. McCray has finished, then we will sing a closing hymn, just a short closing hymn to give the workers time to get into the hall and set things up there. It's the hymn number 232 this time. O sinner, the Savior is calling for thee. Long, long has he called thee in vain. He called thee when joy lent its crown to th thy days. He called thee in sorrow and pain. Let's stand now. No, we'll not stand at this stage. I'm getting ahead of myself. Just keep seated and uh, give the offering, and then we'll stand for whatever verses we have left of this short hymn. 232, singing your very best, please. <coughs>
Well, it gives me a great pleasure now to hand the rest of the service over to Dr. McCray. We trust that God will bless him as he sings and then as he brings to us the message of the Lord. Comfort sinner, seek salvation, Jesus wants to make you right, do not give. But not tonight When the judgment overtakes you How those words will stand
give me a little longer. Don't you see this world? It looks so bright. You know, God, when I feel I'm dying, then I'll be saved. Give me just, give me a little longer Ah, this world, it looks so bright When I feel that I am dying Then I Then I'll be saved, but God not, not tonight. I want us to open our Bibles this evening. In the book of Genesis and the chapter number six. I want to join with the Reverend Irwin to say thank you for those who have attended the mission so faithfully night after night. I want to thank all those that participated, first of all, in the place of prayer, because that's the powerhouse before the meeting. I want to thank those that led in the music night after night, and we don't take that for granted. Those that did the equipment, and those that made the tea for the preacher and his wife afterwards, thank you for your kindness. I'd like to thank the Reverend and Mrs. Irwin, both for their kindness and for their help to me as I have been here night after night in this mission. And we thank God for the time of fellowship we had here in these meetings. We're looking to the Lord for the final meeting, and we pray that God will richly bless us as we conclude this message this evening. Let's open our Bibles, please, the book of Genesis and the chapter number six. A familiar passage for many in the Word of God, and yet a message that is solemn indeed. Verse number one. And it came to pass when men began to multiply in the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they chose them wives of all which they choose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, Yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping things and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. We end our reading there and keep our Bibles open. Let's just bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this gospel mission. We thank Thee for the fellowship with the people of God here. We thank Thee for the opportunity of ministering Thy Word. 
And O oh God, in this final night of the mission, I pray that by thy Holy Spirit, that thou will truly attend every word that is spoken and by the power of the Holy Spirit apply it personally to those that are gathered here. We pray for any tonight who are not saved. O oh God, I pray in Jesus' name, take the curtain back and reveal thy words to their heart. We pray for any tonight that are backslidden in heart and once they walked with thee, but alas, they've been taken into bypath meadows. O oh God, I pray in Jesus' name that thou will restore unto such the joy of thy salvation. We pray for thy children. And even as the word of God is preached, we pray that it might bless their souls and encourage them. Help us not to lose hope, but let us, O oh God, to go forward in thy name, claiming ground, for the glory of Jesus Christ, the King and Head of His Church. And so tonight we leave this service in thy hand. I pray for the covering of the precious blood. And I pray for the infilling of the Holy Ghost. And I pray that only Jesus Christ will be uplifted and glorified. And I ask this all in Jesus' name and for His sake. Amen. In these two weeks of gospel mission, we have sought to be faithful to those that have gathered here night after night, simply proclaiming the word of God. We have dealt with some very solemn subjects. Indeed, everything is solemn when it comes to the word of God because this has concerned eternal realities, not simply of time, but realizing that life at best is very brief. And even at its longest, we have only a little time here. And then we're taken out into God's eternity. We commence with that message on the redemption through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And night after night, we have come to that place where we have visited the cross and we have realized that the only answer for man's sin is in the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and the finished work of our Savior upon the cross of Calvary. He died that I might be forgiven. He died to make us good that we might go at last to heaven saved through his precious blood. We dealt with man's sin. And oh, the reality of man's sin, that's the breath that nobody wants to own. And yet, my friend, it's the thing that stains the heart of every man and every woman in this meeting this evening. We have talked about the love of God, how that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We've talked about salvation, the gift of God, eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And thank God we preach salvation through Christ alone. We talked about death. The last enemy, the Bible tells us, that shall be destroyed. It's death. And every one of us, the word of God says, we all must needs die. No argument with that. Every one of us. See, if the Lord's return, let me tell you, will walk through the valley of death. And for some who are not saved, let me tell you, those who are not saved, it's not the shadow of death. It's the real thing. It's not a shadow, my friend. A shadow cannot hurt you. But oh, the reality of death itself. When man goes out into God's eternity and they're cast into hell, which is the second death. To be eternally separated from God. We've spoken about eternity, heaven, for those who are saved, and hell for those who are not. And everyone in this meeting tonight is on the way to one or the other. Right now, you're on that journey. Either to heaven with Christ or hell without Him. We better face the realities. But tonight I want us to go back to the beginning of the book. I want us to come to Genesis. 
And when we come to the book of Genesis, friend, here we see, recorded by the Spirit of God, the tragedy of man's fall. And how it happened. Now in Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 27 concerning mankind, it says this. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Yes, in the image of God. And whenever man was created, my friend, when Adam was created, the Bible tells us in the image of God. Not a fallen man, but a man who is created in the image of God. Man, you know, was a unique creation. No beast was ever created like that. But then we find that man, although he was perfect, the Word of God tells us the pathway of his rebellion. And how that Adam sinned defiantly, Adam sinned in his rebellion, Adam sinned, my friend, deliberately. He partook of that fruit and he, he ate of it, even though God said, Adam, the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Adam couldn't say, God, you didn't tell me. God, you didn't warn me. God, you let me go on and do my own thing, but why didn't you tell me? Let me tell you, my friend, there's many a man in hell will curse the preacher that stood in the pulpit and never preached the gospel, he said. Why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you warn me? Why did you let me go on and the sin and go to hell? He curses preacher in eternity forever. He never preached the gospel to him. And God says, their blood he'll require at the preacher's hand. And you know, whenever we come from that chapter, whenever it says in chapter 3 in the verse 24, so God drove out the man. Out of the garden because of a sin. And God placed to the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So that man couldn't touch it. And man was driven from the garden. And friend Isaiah chapter 59 says, Your sin has separated between you and God. And sin separates man from God, friend. Your sin is separating you from God right now. And that's why if you die in your sin, friend, you'll be separated from God forever and ever and ever and ever in a Christless eternity. Your sin. Not somebody else's. You can't blame somebody else, friend. It's your sin. Your sin separates between you and God. The sad fruit of sin and the harvest Sin was realized not only in spiritual death, but in physical death. Because Adam had two boys. Adam and Eve had two boys. One was called Cain and one was called Abel. One day they went out into the field together, having offered their offerings to God. And Abel offered what God required, the blood sacrifice, and Cain offered the works of his own hand, just like so many people in Korean. If you're asking, how are you trying to get to heaven? Well, I do the best I can. And surely God couldn't require of me anything else when I do the best I can. Friend, listen, if you could get to heaven by the best you can, then God made the biggest mistake in sending his son to Calvary and shedding his precious blood. But God didn't, because Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life. And then he said this, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. And Cain rose up against his brother Abel, and Cain slew his brother. And there's the first physical death when Cain became a murderer. Do you remember what Cain cried? He said, my punishment is greater. 
than I can bear. Let me tell you, my friend, every soul in hell is crying the same. Every lost man, woman, young person that dies without the Lord Jesus Christ, if you could put your ear to the chapter of hell, they would say, Preacher, tell them my punishment is greater than I can bear. Ah, the fruit of sin. The devil says, Thou shalt not surely die. God says, You would. Who was right, friend? You know, the world tells you, sin away there. Sure, so a bit of a game. And sure, at the end of the door, God, at the end of the day, God will open the door to heaven, let everybody in. Nobody's excluded out of heaven. Let me tell you, friend, it's a lie. But then what, men want to believe a lie, don't they? They want to believe a lie. When it comes to these issues of their soul. As the generations passed after Cain and Abel, the number of men multiplied upon the earth. So the depravity of man's heart they exposed. You notice in the first chapter of the book of Genesis, if you look just there at verse 31, whenever God finished his creation, this is what it says in verse 31, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Just mark those words, and God saw. And what did God see? Whenever God looked at the creation that he had made, he beheld and he said, it was very good. Now the next time that those words are written in the Bible, God saw, is found in this sixth chapter of the book of Genesis. Just move over to a place. Because when you come to Genesis chapter 6, would you go down there in verse number 2? The sons of of God saw the daughters of men. No, no, that's not God. But go down to verse 5. And God saw. Now remember what God saw the first on the sixth day of creation. God beheld and it was very good. And now it says, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great. This is something that's not very good, my friend. Yes, it's something that's great. But what is it? God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. You know, that reminds me, sin is not hid from God. God saw. And friend, tonight, let me tell you, the Bible says, Thou God seest me. And there's not one of us in this meeting tonight, but God has seen our hearts. And God has examined our hearts. And God knows our hearts. The omniscience of God. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles 16 verse 9, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. Proverbs 15 and verse 3, the eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. God saw. And here sitting in this meeting, God sees you. Now, friend, let me tell you, God doesn't see perhaps what others see. God doesn't even see what you see about yourself because you think you're all right. But God sees you as you are. God does not look on the outward appearance, friend. God looks on the heart. So what did God see? Now, let's look at that verse number five. And God saw. And what did he see? He saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Here we have its intensity. Here's the amount of it. Here is the evil of it. It was awful. It was great. Man plays around with sin. Man plays down the awfulness of sin today. But God doesn't. And when God looks into the heart, friend, he sees a heart that is stained with sin. 
the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And then look at verse number five again. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Here we have his totality. Listen, every imagination of the thoughts of his heart. What does that tell me? It means that God looks deep. No, no, he's not looking on the surface. He's not looking the outward appearance. He's looking right into the heart, your heart, friend. And what does God see? He said he saw every imagination. That means every desire, every aspiration, every determination, every purpose, every motivation, every ambition of man's heart. It was only evil continued, contaminated by sin. And friend, every one of us have got this problem. There's not one of us without it. Preacher included. I was born in sin. You say, but I don't believe that sin so deep. Surely not every imagination of the thoughts of man's heart does evil continue. Surely man's good in himself. Just keep your hand there. Let's go to the book of Romans chapter 3 now. What does God say in Romans chapter 3 and verse number 10? We'll start there. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouths is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. And there is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, listen to this, and all the world may become guilty before God. Guilty. And when God looked into man's heart for him, Remember, he was created in the image of God, but he turned his back on God and he chose the path of sin. And God says concerning him, every imagination of the thoughts of his heart, he's contaminated by sin. That's the depravity of man. The depravity of man. Ah, But I'm a good person. And yet the Bible says there's none to do it good. No, not one. Of ourselves, my friend, there's not one that meets up to the standard of God. Not one of us. And the word of God says, so that the world is guilty before God. Now remember this when you leave this old world, friend. And you close your eyes on death. The Bible says it's appointed unto men once to die. But after this, after this, the judgment. I saw the dead and great, the small and great stand before God. And you'll meet God, friend. You'll stand before God. And you notice what it says there in that verse 5 of chapter 6. Every imagination didn't say some. Every imagination of the thoughts of his heart, listen, was only evil continually. Take every word in its own, friend. Don't try to skip over anything. The Holy Ghost didn't put it there just for you to drop over it. Every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Continually. That's why Isaiah the prophet said in chapter 1 and verse 6, from the sole of the foot even to the, onto the head, there is no soundness in it. Verse 5 of, first, of Isaiah chapter 1, the whole head is sick and the whole heart is faint. 
Not a part of it, friends. The whole heresy. Only evil continually. That's his constancy. Listen, continually. That means all the time. Now, that's not the picture that man paints of himself. We don't like this picture, but this is God's word, friend. This is a God that you have to meet. This is a God that one day you'll stand before. I, Jeremiah, God says through his prophets, the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Deceitful. You see, we lie to ourselves. 1 John chapter 1 says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And God's word's not in us. Why? Because God's word says we are sinners. And the heart of man is so deceitful. Listen, it's not that he lies to somebody else. He's lying to himself. He tells himself, listen, go on the way you are. And it will not matter to God. Live as you want to live. Sin as you want to sin. Die as you want to die. And go out into God's eternity as you want. But there's no problem. Sure, God's going to open the door and you're going to sweep in. And those that stand at your grave will say, Ah, they're with the angels in heaven now. Friend, it doesn't matter what they say at your grave. You're already there. And it'll not be changed. And if you die in your sin where Christ is, you'll never be. In other words, you'll never be in heaven. And the preacher will not be able to send you there. Isaiah chapter 64 says, We are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses, that's the best that we can do, all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Filthy rags. Romans chapter 7, verse 18. In my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Now, can't you see? This is what God sees, friend. Thou, God, seest me. And when God looks into the sinner's heart, God sees a heart that is stained by sin. Sin that's rotten. Sin that's putrid. Sin that's vile. Sin that's evil. The wickedness of man was great. No, it wasn't the goodness. It's the wickedness of man. That's what God saw. But what did God say? Well, notice what he said, or what he saw. Verse 5. What does it say about God? God says in verse 7, I will destroy man. See, there's a price for sin. Romans chapter 6, 23, the wages of sin. But notice whenever God looked on this scene, how did God feel, friend? The God who made man in his own image. Look at verse 6. It repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Notice, it didn't grieve them. No, they were enjoying their sin. The Bible says, listen, the pleasures of sin. Never let the preacher say there's no pleasure in sin. Yes, there is. The pleasures of sin, it says in the book of Hebrews, but they're only for a season. In other words, they don't last. So, sinner, if you want your sin, listen, you better get your pleasure now because I want to tell you, your pain's coming. Pleasure's over. God said to Belshazzar, party's over. 
Dear sinner, I want to tell you before God, I don't care what you are, and I don't care who you are, but I tell you, God Almighty, I holds a breath in your, your body in his hands, and God says, party's over, you have got to go. Oh no, it didn't grieve them. They were enjoying their sin, but it grieved him. You know, grief, I was looking at that word, it's actually grief's a love word. You ever thought of that? Grief is a love word. Because you do not grieve for those you do not love. You've heard of a person who dies and their loved ones grieve over them. Why? Because they love them. And their heart's grieving. is broken. Hurt. That they're no longer there. So I want to tell you, your sin grieves God. Your sin brings sorrow and pain to the heart of God. Your sin is a heartache to God. It hurts him. And God looked up a man. That's what he saw. That's why, friend, you know, whenever the Lord Jesus Christ one day stood on the top of the Mount of Olives and he looked over the city of Jerusalem and the Bible says as he looked over that city that he loved and healed their sick and even raised the dead. Yet they turned their back and cried, we will not have this man to rule over us. Listen, Jesus stood and the Bible says, Jesus wept over the city. Why? Because their sin grieved him. How oft, he said, how oft would I have gathered thee as a hen would gather her chicks under her wings, but he would not. But he wouldn't. Jesus looked over that city and the scorching tears ran down the Savior's lovely cheeks because their sin grieved him. One day he went to the side of a grave and they told him to take away the stone and there at that grave the Bible says Jesus wept, the shortest verse in the Bible. Because when Jesus looked at that grave, he saw there the reality of man's sin. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth what? Death. But only Jesus could turn that situation into joy. Because he stood at the side of that grave and he cried, the Bible says with a loud voice, Lazarus! Come forth! And Lazarus came forth, bound, hand and foot, and then he said to the disciples, Loose him and let him go. Grieved that man who originally had been made in the image of God had fallen so low. But God says, I'll destroy. Because God, listen my friend, God will judge sin. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And you see, when God says, I will judge, I will destroy man, let me tell you, man. notice, I will. I will destroy Man, whom I have created from the face of the earth. When God said it, my friend, it was as good as done. But let me tell you, when God says something, God keeps his word. You can depend on God's word, friend. When God made a promise to me 
the gift of God is eternal life. And thank God when I received and reached out my hand of faith and I received God's gift for my soul, he gave me eternal life. And he said, I'd never perish, neither should any pluck me out of his hand. And thank God when he said it, he meant it. God says what he means. When God says, I will never leave thee nor forsake you, thank God he means it. You can rest at night. Praise God, you can face the greatest trial of another day, knowing you never face it alone because he says, I'll never leave you. Whenever he promises, he'll fulfill. And God says, I will destroy. I'll destroy man. But then it says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and he told Noah, build an ark. God in love and God in mercy and God in grace told Noah to build the ark, the only place of safety from the impending judgment of God. I want to tell you, my friend, my Savior and the cross work of Christ, that's God's ark for my soul. Thank God I'm hidden in Christ tonight. Thank God I'm in his ark. And no matter how great the storms beat upon the ark, thank God I'm safe in Christ. For 120 years, Noah built that ark and preached. Word of God called him a preacher of righteousness. In other words, he preached just like me in cold rain. Noah preached to his neighbors and his friends as he built that ark. Then it says in 1 Peter 3, verse 20, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. The long suffering of God, friend. But then read Genesis 6, verse 3. And God said, my spirit shall not always strive with man. You see, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, and then there came the day when God said, Noah, yet seven days, there was God's mercy again. Noah, tell them, seven days to judgment. Seven days until the destruction comes. And the judgment falls. And Noah went out and he told his friends, yet seven days, just seven days more. And he begged them to come into the ark. But they wouldn't come in. And then God said, Noah, come in, Noah. He didn't say go in. He says, come in, because God was already there. God says, come on unto me, Noah. Come on. And Noah came in, and his wife came in, and his three sons and their three wives. <coughs> Somebody said that Noah had failed in his preaching. Friend, I believe that Noah was a successful preacher. Do you know why? He got the whole family in. And any safe father in this meeting tonight, let me tell you this, that's what you long for more than anything else, is to get all the children in. And then the Bible says, God shut to the door. Noah didn't close the door, friend. God did. God says, yet seven days, and then those seven days would pass, and God says, Noah, come in. And when Noah walked up that ramp, God shut the door. And those that were in were saved. And those that were outside were lost. The long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. But God says, my spirit shall not always 
God doesn't always wait for him. Because God's mercy can be refused. And no one went in. In the closing moments, let me say this. My spirit shall not always strive. God's spirit strives with man. God's good. God doesn't let you go to hell, friend. God is indeed putting barriers. This mission has been a barrier to souls who have come to hear the word of God. And I tell you, my friend, if you die in your sin and go to hell, it's not that God hasn't reached out his hand of mercy to you. God has. You are brought here. You've heard the word of God preached. But you've jumped over every barrier. No, God! I'm not coming tonight! The mission's over this night, friend. Let me tell you, God has given you another opportunity. God's spirit strives with man. When a man realizes that he's a sinner, that's the spirit of God that shows that. When a man realizes indeed that if he dies in a sin, he'll be in a lost eternity, that's the spirit of God that reveals that. When a man feels the guilt of his sin, that's not the preacher. That's the Spirit of God. When he sees the folly of seeking salvation outside of Jesus Christ, for there is none, that's the Spirit of God. Only Jesus, only Jesus can do poor lost sinners good. That's the Spirit of God that's driving that home. Why? Because God's Spirit strives with man. God uses many things. Sometimes it's sickness. Do you remember Naaman in the scriptures? Naaman was a great man with his master. He led the armies. Indeed, he led the soldiers into Israel, took out the little slaves. Remember the wee girl in his house? He was a great man, but he was a leper. And then, my friend, he faced death. And isn't it amazing? It wasn't until a sickness came that anybody was concerned about Naaman. He didn't need anybody to be concerned because he was a great man. Everything that he asked for was his. But one day he saw a little white spot as the start of leprosy. And he was a leper. And then a wee girl told them about God's man in Israel. And he told them to wash in the Jordan and be clean. Do you remember Jarius? Jarius was a leader in the synagogue. In actual fact, he wouldn't have respected Jesus or wanted Jesus until his wee girl of 12 years of age was sick. And he tried every doctor there was. And she was about to die. And through that sickness, Jarius ran to the feet of Jesus and fell down before him and said, come into my house. My only little daughter, 12 years of age, is dying. Come, lay thy hand. Sometimes God uses sorrow. Sometimes it's death in the family. I remember I preached a mission of an Oma. Remember the last Sunday night of the mission? Reverend Kearns was the minister at that time. And remember whenever the appeal was made, I remember a man and woman sitting over on my right-hand side together and their hearts were breaking. They were crying together when the appeal was given. They got out of their seat and they walked in the inquiry room. I remember going into the inquiry room and Mr. Kern said to me, Mr. McCree, let me tell you the story. Just a wee while ago, this man and woman had three wee children. They were building their new house. They were in a farm. They were building their new house. They were living in a caravan. 
one morning it was time for the milkman to come and collect the milk. And the mother went down to the dairy to bring the milk up to the house for the family. And as she was making her way back to the caravan, she saw the caravan on fire. Those three wee children were burnt to death. Harry said to me, you know, that, that day we had the funeral. The first coffin of a child was taken down the church and then the second. And then the father went up alone the last time and took the little white coffin of a baby. And he said he put his head upon the coffin. And all I could hear him cry was, Oh, my little cuddles, my little cuddles. As he tried to walk down in front of the congregation. That night in that mission, Mom and Dad came to Jesus and rested their soul in Christ. Sometimes God uses sorrow for him. Sometimes God uses a saint, faithful Sunday school teacher. Sometimes God uses a faithful mother that tells her son or daughter of the need of Jesus. Sometimes the Spirit of God strives through a verse, maybe a gospel tract of the Scriptures. God says, my spirit strives with man. You're here tonight and God's speaking to your heart about your soul's salvation, friend. Let me tell you, you should thank God because God's striving with you. But remember this, the word of God says, my spirit shall not always strive. Man resists the striving of God. God says in the book of Proverbs, I have called, but ye have refused. I have stretched out my hands with the marks of Calvary upon them, says Jesus, but you didn't want to regard it, you pushed it away. Yes, God strikes, but man resists. Paul was preaching and Felix trembled. But he resisted the call of God and went to hell. Spirit of God was striving through Paul when he was speaking to Agrippa. And Agrippa cried out, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. But all oh, almost was not enough. For Agrippa refused. Rejected. Tell me, what about you? There's a preacher, Dr. Hall, was preaching one night in one of the wealthiest parts of New York. And in the service was a young lady, a beautiful dancer. The appeal was made at the end of the service. She was speaking to the preachers who was going out. And this is what she said. If I, if I must make a choice, I will hold on to the dance and I'll let Jesus go. Yes, men resist the call of God. Tell me, why aren't you saved? How many times has God spoken to your heart and still you're unconverted, still you're unsaved, still you're rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ? You're resisting the Spirit of God. Why? Is it because of people? You're afraid of what people would say? Is it because of pride? You don't want to humble yourself and take your place as a sinner. No, I'm not a sinner. I'm not a sinner. And God says you are. You're too proud to humble yourself. You couldn't walk the aisle and say, Preacher, lead me to Jesus Christ. No, you're too proud. Is it pleasures? 
I don't want to give up the pleasures of the world. But you'll be taken from them. Is it possessions? Grabbing after things, let me tell you, to stay. And yet you have to go. Men resist the Spirit of God. But verse I'm finished. God's striving doesn't remain forever. My spirit shall not always strive. Romans chapter 1. And God gave them up. Or as also in the same chapter. And God gave them over. You want your sin? Take it. But remember. There's no return. No return. Proverbs chapter 1 says, I will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear comes. Then shall they call upon me. But I will not answer. When God's ear and God's heart is closed to your pleading, the man down in the last eternity cried, Oh, Father Abram, send Lazarus to my brothers and tell them not to come to hell. Answer was nay. Have mercy upon me. But mercy was over. Why? Because, friend, God's patience God's spirit shall not always strive with man. Jesus says, I go my way. Walk the way for a last time. And you'll die in your sin. Where I am, you can't go. With this, I'm closing. Some years ago, I remember when I went to Belfast, first of all, Dr. Paisley was preaching in the old church in the Ravenna Road. As a young woman came to his meeting Sunday after Sunday, and he saw that after some months visiting there, she would be sitting in the meeting and when the appeal was made at the end she would be in tears as she went to the door one night and shook her hand he begged her to come to Christ she says Mr. Paisley there's a dance on Thursday night Mr. Paisley surely God wouldn't cut me off But I want to go to the dance. I'm not come. Friend, let me tell you, that girl went home. She left the service the night, the following Sunday night, she was in the meeting. The appeal was made at the end of the service. There were no tears. No concern. Dr. Pacey went down to the door, shook hands at the door with a young woman. And they asked her to come to Christ. She said, Mr. Mr. Pacey, let me tell you something. She said, I went home last Sunday night concerned and burdened about my soul. Because I was here in tears. I went to bed and I couldn't sleep. And I tossed and I turned, but remember, I wanted to dance on Thursday night. And I tossed and I turned and I tossed and I turned and I couldn't get to sleep at all because I knew God was speaking to me. Listen to me carefully, friend. 
She said, I got out of my bed. I got down on my knees and I said, God, lead me. Lead me. And she said, Dr. Paisley, I want to tell Mr. Paisley, I want to tell you. Like that. I got into my bed and I went to sleep. And I've never had a thought about my soul all week. And to tell you, I'll never be back. Don't play around with your soul, friend. It's the most precious possession you have. Jesus said, what should it profit a man if he gained the whole world? And you won't, but even if you did. And you lost your own soul. For what can a man give in exchange for a soul? And the answer is, Nothing. Nothing. Don't play the fool, friend. Don't play with your soul. Don't tell God to leave. Don't say to God another night, go. Oh, I'll come and I'll go see him some other night. Who promised you? God says, boast not yourself of tomorrow. This could be the last night you'll ever hear God's call. Tell me, what will you do with Jesus? Will you trust him? Will you reject him? But you will do something tonight. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we bow in thy holy presence tonight, realize that we're in a solemn moment. It's invitation time. And God is standing by. Man's heart is stained by sin. But Lord, you want to enter. Oh God, don't let them turn you away. Oh Spirit of God, draw men and women. Strive with them tonight. Put that barrier up, Lord, that they can't get over. Oh, God, you love them. You love them. You love them so much you give your darling son to the cross. And there he shed his precious blood to take away their sin. Oh, God, show them their sin tonight but show them the lovely Savior who's able to save them from their sin. As their heads are bowed and eyes are closed, tell me, what will you do with Jesus tonight? Him writer said, just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me and that thou bidst me come to thee. Friend, he bids you come. He offers you life eternal. But you've got to come. And the only way you can is come as a sinner to Jesus, just as you are. Please don't walk away. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, we sing that other verse. Friend, we're singing it for you, the final invitation of the mission. Maybe the final invitation you'll ever hear. The final call of God. What are you going to do with Jesus? You will accept or you will reject. But you will do something tonight. If there's one in this gathering, sinner or backslider, you say, preacher, point me to Jesus. I want to I know, want to know God's peace and pardon within my soul. Back to it, I want to get back to the Lord. I want to get back to you, Lord. I'm tired of strain. Preacher, point me to Jesus. As we sing this verse, man, woman, boy, girl, up there in the gallery or downstairs, 
If that's the desire of your heart as we sing this verse, would you slip that hand above your head that I'll see it? Indicate that desire. Preacher, point me to Jesus. And when the meeting's over, we'll go to a private room, we'll open the Word of God, we'll show you God's way of salvation. How you can be dead uncertain that you're saved just as I am. ready for having the meal. The dear one that raised the hand, I'll be making the little room after shaking hands at the door. Please wait and we'll go to the little room here at the back side of the pulpit and we'll open God's word quietly together. You say I didn't get my hand up, preacher, but I'd love to be saved. Oh, how I'd love to get this settled. Please don't walk away. Don't reject the Saviour, friend. It's it's dangerous. Eternity. Eternity. Unsaved, eternally lost. Don't miss the Lord. We're here to help you. We'll simply point you to Jesus. For Christ alone is the answer. Heavenly Father, bless your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Just let us sing a couple of verses to give the folks time. But the one that raised the hand... Please, I'll be. In the, I'll go to the door to shake hands, but then we'll come to the little inquiry room. Please come and speak to me. And anyone else wants to speak to me, let me know at the door. Don't go away without Jesus. I beg you, don't go home without Christ. Amen. Two hundred and forty-two. Then number 242, Sinner, how thy heart is troubled, God is coming very near. Do not hide thy deep emotion, do not check that falling tear. We'll just sing two verses, verses one and two. Let's stand together, please, as we sing these words. <laughs>
Father in heaven, we thank thee for tonight. Thank thee for the solemnity of thy nearness and thy presence. We do ask of thee now to continue to speak to our hearts, accept of our thanks for these good things provided for us. Bless those who have to leave and go their several ways. May God be with them and bless them. And may they treasure up in their hearts the good word of God at the fair tonight. And for others who are able to stay for a little time, Lord, for a time of fellowship and friendship, God bless them. And even now, may the Lord even work on some heart or hearts. And may this be the night when they will close with Christ. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.